Hey everyone, you're listening to Verified, a podcast that centers conversations around equity and inclusion. Today we have a very special guest and recent Ryerson alumni. Mike, do you mind just introducing yourself? What's going on? Uh, my name is Mike Frigis. I'm a Ryerson alumni and I'm also a filmmaker. Amazing. Um, so I just want to dive into your relationship with Ryerson and start from there because you actually didn't go to Ryerson for film. No, no, no. You did your research. I like that. I like that. <laughs> So I actually went to Ryerson for business management. Um, and the reason why I went for business management is because when you're younger, you yeah. kind of idealize a lot of things. And I was like, you know, I wanted to get into a film, but you know, you want to check the landscape out. So I was like, let me do something practical. And then if it doesn't work out, you know, I have a backup route. But mm-hmm. uh, I'm happy I did business because it taught me a lot. And you're lucky now because I feel like where you are in your life, you actually get to intersect the two of those together. Um, so in my research, I actually found out that you're doing a little bit entrepreneurism on the side. Do you want to dive into that a little bit? Yeah. So that's uh, it's funny. I actually study that, you know, and yeah, that's just, but that came more out of like, realizing that no one's really going to give you anything, mm-hmm. especially in my industry. So in order for you to get to your goals, I think it's really, really important for you to take that entrepreneurship route. You know, take you know, take the bull by the horn, so to say. Okay, so diving into that, because you did choose business. I wouldn't say over film, because film is your passion and you're still doing it. But in an academic lens, you choose. You chose to go down that direction. Um, so why, like, how were you able to stick with film and pursue that as a passion while still being in business? Well, my GPA, <laughs> you know, um, you know, it was it was tough. I want to keep it all the way real with you. It was really tough, but I knew what I wanted, and I think coming into, I remember like coming onto the campus. I don't think the SLC was built at the time. I was like, you know, this has to work, mm-hmm. and it having to work, I knew I had to really, really dedicate myself and. What's interesting is that I took a course in fourth year called like I think my capstone. And what's interesting was that like my teacher had us doing storyboards hmm. and telling stories. I was like, this is what I do. So I think it was prophetic in that way. I do want to dive into you as a storyteller, but before we do that, because at Ryerson specifically, I have friends who are in film and they say it's such a hard industry, like there's not a lot of one representation. So if you are colored, there's it's harder to find a mentor who can help you in that light. But then film is expensive and no one wants to talk about that. So when you, first of all, how did you know you were good at film? And then did you have mentors or things along the way who actually helped you um, become a better filmmaker? Well, thank you for saying I'm good at film because I, <laughs> I think I'm getting better. Um, but I think with film, I just knew it was something that I always wanted. And, you know, I think we can really look at other people's lives and what they've accomplished. But I think it's important to look at your own. Mm-hmm. So I knew my goal is just to get better. Every project I make, let's just get better. As opposed to saying, hey, you know, this has to be the best. And I knew that I wanted to sell projects that were really, really close to my heart. But going on to that, I think the reason why I was failing a lot more at first is because lack of knowledge. Okay. And I think that's when a good mentor comes into the picture. And, and do been, you have a mentor? Yes. Okay. And I'm really, really happy about mentors. You know, I'm mm-hmm. really, really happy about that. And they taught me, you know, so much about the business. Like imagine having somebody with 30 years of experience saying, hey, you know, that's a pothole. Don't do that. Mm-hmm. That's a pothole. Don't do that. But I think getting a mentor is a very, very interesting thing. You have to show them that you're serious. Because mm-hmm. I think if somebody identifies with the traits that they have in you, you know, it's like, you know, that guy's like a younger me, then they're most likely to help you out. Exactly. And also coming into this, I was like, yo, I'm black, you know, I don't know if any other mentors will help. You'd be surprised. People of other races have really, of course, people of my own mm-hmm. race, but people of other races have supported me. So it just comes to really exhibit the qualities that your mentor has, the dedication, the seriousness, you know, if somebody wants to meet you at coffee at 12, you got to be there 11.45. You know, mm-hmm. you have to do research and you have to memorize. It. It's almost like a test, you know? And, you know, I have to say the mentors have helped me out a lot with knowledge. So I'm super excited about How that. How did you find those mentors? Um, like I said, it's something I really, really want to do. Okay. Um, there's actually a mentor. He's, he's a director. Um, I was on set one day 
And um, well, I don't advise anybody to do this, but I did this. <laughs> um, but I saw the crew really talking about how they really, really liked him a lot. So, you know, when the day was done, I snuck up and I was like, hey, you know, my name is Michael. I'd love to show you my stuff. And he was like, yeah, well, um, come shadow me. Hmm. And then that's how that happened. And I have his email. And turns out he was nominated for an Oscar. Wow. He's from, he's from America too. So that's incredible. So you just shoot your shot. You have to. For the listeners. Just ball, ball in that yeah. court. And seriously, shoot your shot, you know? Mm-hmm. Because the worst thing somebody could say is no. And as people of color, we have to start realizing that, okay, let's bring it back in a sociological context. Cause everybody, this industry, of course, there are racist people out there, mm-hmm. but the way this industry works is like connections. So, for example, you and I have a connection, right? Mm-hmm. So, say we're both older, we're both like in the business, and you have a child. Be like, hey, yo, Mike, can you know my child come work on your set? Sure. That's how connections happen. Mm-hmm. So, I realized that in order for me to really make it into the industry, I don't look like convention. So, I have to have an unconventional strategy. You know, how do you hustle smarter? You mm-hmm. know, I maybe wouldn't be able to go through certain processes that other people might do, but I can go talk to a director and say, hey, this is something I want to do. Interesting. That's okay. So there's a couple things you said in that. Um, One, you don't always have to have a mentor who looks like you. And I think Mm -hmm. that is very unconventional. And that might just put people of color in boxes too. Mm -hmm. Um, Because I think a lot of times, uh, and you can correct me if you don't agree with this, Mm -hmm. but I think we box ourselves in by being like, you know what, I need someone who's black. Um, surprisingly, a lot of my mentors are white males, but I think that has gotten me further because I haven't limited myself to a victimology type of thinking. I'm like, okay, they're successful. Let me talk to them. Why are they successful? Because it seems like the people I'm looking up to right now are not successful, but I like the way they're telling their story. So how can I tell that story, but also get to success? And then you can group together different types of people who will push you along the way. So speaking of that, how we actually met was I did something for the first time in my life that I was so fearful of. Um, So we met at MindFest in 2017. So I was thinking about it last night. I was like, whoa, like when was this? Because it seems like last year, but it wasn't. Mm -hmm. Um, Shout out to 2020. (laughs) Um, But MindFest was a mental health um, panel and where like people came um, to share their stories about their journey with mental health and academia. And you were actually filming that day. Um, So for students who are on campus who might not be in film, how did you secure that opportunity? Um, That's a good question. Um, And the opportunity came from putting myself in these situations. Mm. Like I said, it's unconventional. So if you really think about it, well, even 2017 film, I feel like film now it's become a lot more ubiquitous and, you know, everybody's filming, which is great. But uh, even back in 2017, you mm-hmm. know, I don't think there are as many filmmakers or it wasn't at the point it has, it is at currently. So I realized that, you know, the film program has a bunch of film students. Other programs don't. Other faculties don't. So I probably know they need someone to film. Mm-hmm. And I actually made like some money doing student group videos for like the past three years. And that was a little part-time hustle song. So this, what advice would you give to students who aren't in film, um, who want those types of jobs on campus? I think really present yourself and do it. You know, people, I realize people are more likely to give you opportunities than you think. Mm. And if you show that you're competent and you can do the work and, you know, you're willing to listen, you can do it. And we really, like I said, that's a very interesting point of view you brought up of the victim mentality, mm-hmm. you know, victimization. It's how, about, it's how you feel about yourself. And first of all, Toronto's very diverse. So that's a leg up. And two, it's like, if your work is good, mm-hmm. people will find you. That's valid. Um, to continue with MindFest, though, you talked a little bit earlier that um, the work you do has a personal aspect of it. When you choose to work for student groups or um, do passion projects that aren't, you're not writing in them or um, like it wasn't your ground foundation, but someone was like, hey, can you film this for me? Do you align your values with that? So for MindFest, it being mental health, like did you seek that or did it come to you? Um, I think with MindFest, I I look at this as jobs. You know Mm -hmm. what I mean? Like when you're, Working for somebody, you're working for somebody. So it's what they want. Mm-hmm. It's like this, just like you go to a restaurant, right? And your customer comes and says, Hey, I want a 
burger with cheese, you know? It's your job to go in the back and make that the best burger possible with cheese and present it to them. Mm-hmm. On my own passion projects, I can do whatever I want. But as long as you're working for someone, as long as you have a client, it's important for you to adhere to their values. And I think later on now, I've been fortunate enough to do work and projects where I have a personal connection to the story. Mm-hmm. But earlier on, it's like, hey, Mike, you know, we want a two camera setup, you know, videotape this conference. And I'm like, hey, let's make it happen. I like that. That's very valid. So like you actually have to insert yourself in the hustle so that you know like in the future you can do your own things that Absolutely. align with your values. That's good advice. Um, I'm going to look at my cards because I don't want to get oh, it's um, all good. It's this all good. It's film cool. wrong. Um, okay. Hold on. No, 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 it's still on here. Okay. So you recently co-directed a film called Worst Student Ever. Um, I've actually attended Rise, so I knew immediately, I was like, oh, that's like the founder of Rise. Um, so I want to ask you, because that film shines a light on his journey within the education system. So what was your experience like in academia? Um, so just pulling back, I co-directed it with a good friend. So you're absolutely right on that. And to her credit, that was more of her story and her point of view mm-hmm. when it comes to the education side. You know, shout out to Dizzy, that's family for life. <laughs> um but from my own personal point of view, it was a black man discovering who he is. That was my personal into the story. And that's and I'm happy because I was able to bring that layer mm-hmm. into the narrative storytelling. And that was cool because I found a bit of myself, you know, throughout the whole process of somebody that, you know, if you watch the movie, he always says, like, this isn't easy to navigate. This isn't easy mm-hmm. to navigate. I'm like, you know, I totally relate to that. And being able to you know, show that to an audience has been gratifying. Mm -hmm. So I can relate to, I'm a first generation student. So the navigation part is challenging. Um, But I find that term is used so loosely now. When you say it was hard to navigate, just for the listeners, what does that mean in your experience? In terms of the school system? Yeah. I think it's just hard to navigate because, you know, school and being young and those are really primitive times in your life Mm -hmm. and that actually shapes who you are so if you're not in that environment of reinforcement and positivity Mm -hmm. it's not good fortunately like growing up at an amazing teacher who really believed in me and teachers believed in me so that really reinforced it but unfortunately in certain areas where the access or the funding isn't there the kids don't have the same type of gratification the kids don't have the same type of positive reinforcement like you know when you're young you just want to be told that look you're good mm-hmm. you're great you're good at what you do and that really builds up your self esteem so it's really unfortunate i hope that movie starts to shine light on that mm-hmm. you're a very confident person i would say so Thank do you, you feel like growing up you had that positive reinforcement whether that was in the education system or just at home um well, at home, I okay. just say like a great mom, uh, who's like you know you're the like, you're the man. <laughs> but it actually, I actually wasn't too confident growing okay. up. You know, I think I didn't understand what it was like being black growing up. You know, I grew mm-hmm. up in a diverse school, and then you don't understand certain things. You know what I mean? Like, oh, Mike can't come over here, or you know, Mike, we don't really like you. Things of that mm-hmm. nature, and I just never really understood it. But worse off, I ignored it, and I thought I was different. Because you know I'm articulate and mm-hmm. all that type of shit, but then you start to realize that no, you're not different. You know what I mean? You get the wrong place, wrong time. You will be mistaken for somebody else, and that's happened to people that I know. Mm-hmm. So that was really, really tough. But I think the internal confidence came from, you know, accepting who you are, and but being around good people. And arguably speaking, like my friends are all from diverse circumstances. Like, yo, Mike, you don't have to be that person Mm -hmm. and that builds that type of confidence how did you so this is a question that I feel like again everyone says and I know my journey of how I got there but accepting yourself like how did you just like snap in one day and be like yo like I need to live for me like I need to recognize like my life like what was that moment for you oh man that's that's a good question I think that moment came from just waking up and I think, like you said, there's a victim mentality, mm-hmm. and we all get into that. I've been in that for a minute, you know. You know, Mike, you can't do this, or people won't like it. And I was like, look, there's nothing I can change. And then after it's great, it's like you see a lot of black figures mm-hmm. that have done it, and that provides a self confidence. Like you know, Jay Z can do it. I do. Yeah. Tyler Perry, you know, all these Ryan Coogler, all these Barry Jenkins, all these types of notable figures mm-hmm. were able to transcend circumstances. And then at the same time, you see how far we've kind of 
as black people, mm-hmm. like, you know, came to the United States as slaves. And at one point in time, you had the president that was a black dude. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's possible. I like that transcending circumstances. I'm going to use that. Yeah, of um, course. So just to transcend into another topic, um, back, just back on mentors, because I feel like that's so important. Um, as you had mentors, like you might be a mentor right now, or you're definitely going to be one in the future. Hope so. <laughs> what advice, like if a student was coming to you right now in business, let's just like remake your whole situation. Coming to you in business, but they really want to pursue film. Mm-hmm. Um and they need guidance, they need help, what is the first thing you would tell them? I would say, first of all, like understand why you're doing it. Mm-hmm. You know, I think film looks very glamorous. Trust me, it is a lot harder than it looks. You know, 12 hour days are the norm. Mm. You know, you're lugging big equipment. You know, sometimes like my back had, I had to go to chiro, get a chiropractor. Wow. For, yeah, because at times like it got really, really serious. Um, I would say, why you're doing it. And two, it's like, you know, put yourself in those positions. If you love filmmaking, there are opportunities. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like you can go rent a camera. You can go to the DME, rent a camera for free. Mm-hmm. You know, it's possible. And I would also say like, what types of film do you want to do? You know, because there's, there's documentary, music video, commercial. Mm-hmm. You can do weddings. You can do corporate. Like I know a guy that's doing corporate. Like he's not complaining. Let's put it yeah. that way, you know? <laughs> he's not complaining. <laughs> Cha-ching, cha-ching. Yeah, ex- I just heard dollar signs in my head go off. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, so one thing about film, so you're saying like documentaries mm-hmm. and even weddings are like telling a story. You want to mm-hmm. per- like portray that love, right? And make sure that you're getting it and it's a good moment. Mm-hmm. Um, so you define yourself as a storyteller. And I just want to know what that meaning um, means to you. Um, I think a storyteller means somebody who can convey, well, my own definition, mm-hmm. of my own type of storytelling is if you can convey a narrative that's authentic to who you are. Mm. I think that's my own definition of my type of storytelling. And um, taking projects that have failed is because I wasn't being true to who I was. Interesting. And it's crazy. Like, you know, you might get a certain check or might get into a situation, but if you don't believe in a project, of course you have to do things to pay the bills. Mm-hmm. But if you do things just for money or the thought that that, op- that opportunity can give you more opportunities, mm-hmm. that's when I failed. Interesting. So I feel like failure has been brought up a couple of times. Do you take failures or um, I call them checks, but um, criticism, do you take that well? Now I do. Okay. It wasn't always like that. Because um, it's weird. Film's a very weird thing, especially storytelling, mm-hmm. but in, in, in terms of film. Because you're doing something that's true to yourself. You know what I mean? It's therapeutic for some people. Yeah. So you think this is the best story ever, and then somebody's like, uh, it's, it's not that good. But you're like, yo, this is something I believe in. Mm-hmm. I think you have to understand what type of filmmaking. I want to get to like commercial filmmaking. So in terms of like, you know, audiences and mm-hmm. or maybe branded stuff. You have to understand there's an audience and you have to respect the audience. And somebody that's giving you a critique is a possible audience member. You know, if you want to make your own types of films, you can do that. But if you want to embrace the commercial art form of filmmaking, you're going to have to accept critiques. That's so interesting because I'm a poet. And what, well, hold on, hold on. Wait, I, cause I used to define myself this way. And then I took a class and it was a creative writing class. And now I'm, I'm also alumni. And I will say out of my, Five years of university. That was the hardest class I've ever taken um, because you wrote something. You wrote your tw- truth and then you got critiqued and they were like, I don't like it. And it was like mm. very hard because I was like, this is my heart. Like you're asking for my exactly. heart on the page and then you're like actually like stabbing it with like your pencil. Um, so that was very hard for me. I was like, you know what? Fuck this because mm. like now I don't even like, now I'm not even going to write because you're saying it's like the technical parts. Um but then I was like, you know what? I get what you're saying because it's the audience. Mm-hmm. But how do you like when you're making a film and it is you're passionate about it and you're like, no, this is this is right. Like this is how I viewed it. And then someone in like bad words like shits on it. Like mm-hmm. how do, how did you overcome that? Like because you're saying now you're better at taking that. Mm-hmm. Um, what was the process like? Because some people, I'm not gonna at myself, but it hard. Like it take it's. A, Criticism is hard for them to mm-hmm. surpass. So what advice would you give to them just through your own experiences with it? I would say this. I'd rather one person tells me something's bad than the world tells me something's Ooh, bad. Ooh, that's good. Okay. And I always remember that. 
and also who mm-hmm. and their motivation. Like, for example, for 18th birthday, that was developed through a writer named Whitney French in her writing program. And okay. she's, you know, person of color and uh, she's an established writer. She's had like a bunch of, you know, books, all that mm-hmm. good stuff. So I knew her point of view on my story is something okay. I needed. Yeah. Because we understood the same circumstances. Mm-hmm. We were from there. She related to the story I was trying to tell. So I knew that type of insight. And people, like I said, people want to help you. Mm-hmm. You know? So if somebody wants to help you get better, it's always good to listen. But at the same time, it's important to have your own internal, you know, your internal fact check saying, hey, you know what? I know you gave me that note, but this is something I truly believe. Hmm. So it's up to you to make that choice. Okay. So for 18th birthday, let's talk about that. Um, I recently had the privilege to watch the film and like it's about to drop too. Yeah. So we're doing uh, private screenings. So okay. that's sort of the approach. And we'll t- talk okay, more okay. about that later. But, uh, but yeah, so I'm like, super excited about that. And thanks for bringing it up. Thanks for watching it. Of course. It was actually great. And one thing I liked was the story, but I can honestly say... From, I'm not going to spoil it. Mm-hmm. Like people go watch it, um, but the end, Indeed. like the ending, had me shook because the narrative, um, without spoiling it, it's the person who's a good boy will go mm-hmm. out with like kind of the bad guys mm-hmm. and they'll get hurt. Mm-hmm. Um, but that that wasn't the turn, and it was I think it was more meaningful because you just felt that home, that connection mm-hmm. of that's your family, the mm-hmm. ones who are always watching out for you. Mm-hmm. Like their intentions, you might not take it as a good thing in the moment. I have a, a, a younger brother, I was gonna say little and then younger collided. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's this thing like when we we're younger, he's like, Yo, you're like, you're not my mom. Yeah. Um, but sometimes that gets passed down to you because you know what your mom would say, and you're like, Hey, mom's not here. This is what you need to, to hear, right? Um, so that was just such an interesting dynamic. Do you, do you have a sister? Yeah, I do. Okay. Um, so what inspired you to co-write or write the story? Um, what's interesting was for this story, I was in a program called POV Third Street. Okay, um, they're fantastic media training program. Shout out to Danny Dukes; they're amazing program managers. And I actually pitched this story because I knew that I really wanted to tell a story of betrayal and mm-hmm. and and being honest. In that time, I had people that I thought were my homies that are going to be with me for life, but they betrayed me, and that mm-hmm. was very, very very hurtful. Mm -hmm. So I knew I wanted to talk about that. I also knew I wanted to address the household situations because sometimes we lean so much on um, people that don't care about us. But the people that are always there for us, you're going to think they're always there, Mm -hmm. but what if they're not? Ooh, Um, that's very good. So that was really, really good. And then circling back on that, so I pitched the story, didn't get made. So I ended up making Worst Student Ever instead. Mm. And what's interesting is when Worst Student Never got made, I was able to show it to some funding people, and then that's how I got 18th birthday made. Ah, so everything just circles exactly. back. Okay, so that's like a don't give up on never your passions. Never. Um, a lot of times people stress over the productions and getting everything perfect. So this was a cast under 10 people, I think even under five people. Four, five, five. It, five. Okay. Yeah. Um, so do you choose the actors based off of having a relationship with them or do you put out a casting call? So what's interesting was we put out a casting call and then I had a relationship with a couple. Like okay. the, I think the main actress, we went to high school together, which is cool. you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and for the main actor, I think there's something called backstage. I put it up on there and I messaged him. I'm like, you don't have an agent? You don't have this? <laughs> He's like, no. I was like, hey, you want to make a film with me? You know, and he's like, sure, sure. And then uh, the other two guys, I had close relationships with them. I knew them, and then I put them out, and you know, people reached out. Facebook's a great place, and then we made it happen. Amazing, that's so sick. Um, okay, and are you currently working on any new projects? Yes, two. So we got another short film. Okay, I'm shooting, and then uh, doing a web series through the Ryerson Transmedia Zone. Oh, that's sick. So what, I'm excited about that. What does that look like? The the web series? Yeah. Um, so it's gonna explore modern day relationships through social media. So mm. that's gonna be cool. And it's gonna I'm not gonna get in trouble. Yeah. I'm gonna just say um it's gonna be Tyson and Allison, two characters okay. who um are three years into their relationship. Like romantically. Romantically. Okay, interesting. And things start to sort of get stale, you know? So, you know. Allison comes across this application called Mimi that can persuade you through advertising. 
mm. in hopes of getting Tyson to come back to the relationship. And that's all I'm going to say. Okay. We'll leave it there. Yeah. I'm already intrigued. Like, leave me on the edge. Um, I do want to go, since we're on the topic of relationships, you were talking about betrayal mm-hmm. in my 18th birthday and how during that time um, you wanted to convey your, your, like, your experiences and your story, um, but through like art form. And I've, I was saying this to one of my friends the other day. I've been betrayed um, and that has felt worse than heartbreak for me. Um, and I don't know if you can speak to this. Like, how do you get through the pain of betrayal and like old friends, like no longer being in your life, especially if you like hold them to a very high standard? Um, that's a good one. That's a good one. I think when it comes to betrayal, mm-hmm. and this is the thing that hurts the most. Like, you know, you're thinking it's the person right across but it's the person right next to you, mm-hmm. you know? And, you know, really thinking back on those times or things that happened, you start to sort of see patterns. You know what I mean? Hey, I did this great thing. Man, you're a show off. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, but getting through it's just time. I think writing is a great, you know, therapeutic process for a lot of people, mm-hmm. but it's just time and this understanding and growing from it. But also, like I said, listening to older people that are saying, because my mom was like, yo, don't hang out with this person. I'm like, mom, like you don't know what I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. She knows what she's she talking about. She knows what about. she's talking yeah. about. Moms know what they, they have that instinct like, ooh, mm-hmm. this person's bad news. I hear that a lot. This person's bad news. Just bad watch news. yourself. Um, she's, just go deeper in that. Um, w- we live in like a cutoff culture, right? So it's just like, are you more cautious of who you're around? I heard this thing once. It's like, the top five people you surround yourself with, you'll start acting like them That's and true. you'll pick up those like characteristics and the way mm-hmm. they talk. Are you very cautious about those five people that are around you? Now I am. Okay. Um, Cause you start to understand. That's why whenever you have a friend or meet somebody, you just ask them about their life. Mm-hmm. Cause usually their life dictates who they are, how they view the world. So it's like, if somebody comes from a situation that isn't the best, that's the way they view the world, mm-hmm. you know, and you can't blame them for that. You know, um, expectations fuel disappointment. I expected somebody to act like this. Mm-hmm. But when you were around three other of your homeboys, you were acting a certain way. So why would I be different? Exactly. You know, like one of my family members says, like, you're not special. But it's not yeah. in a rude way. But it's true. But it, the point of view that this family member tells me that is because don't expect people to treat you differently. You know, no one's no one's above anything. So if somebody does this to another person, they can do it to you. Mm. Um, so yeah, it is important to have people to be like, no, you're wrong, mm-hmm. and this is why. Because I don't like when people walk on eggshells around me because that makes me be like, why? Why are you afraid to tell me the truth? Like, what do you think is going to happen? Because I actually respond well to the truth. Mm-hmm. Maybe not in the moment, but I'm going to be very thankful that you were real with me. Um, so those are the types of friends I keep in my life. But you did say something. Think about the pe- like how people are viewing the world. Mm-hmm. So how do you view the world? Through a realistic lens. Mm-hmm. I think, um, especially now, understanding and having life experience, I view the world through a realistic and honest lens and through circumstances too. Like, for example, like I know that, hey, look, being a black dude, you kind of have to tread very carefully. No, no, you do have to tread very <laughs> yeah. carefully. So I've understood. So I've really, really understood that. You know, be careful with the company you keep. You mm-hmm. know, my mom always told me if something happens, they're going to look at you. And I never understood. But I'm like, you know what, Mike? You know what, mom? My bad. Yeah. <laughs> I totally get it, you know? Um, and especially viewing the world, you know, I do have optimism. But I think a spade's a spade and just got to view the world through a realistic point of view. So our podcast is called Verified, as you know. Um, And it's kind of just about the relationship we as millennials or just, I guess, all generations are having with social media now. Would you say that social media impacted you and your film career and your writing career in a positive or negative way? Positive, I have to say. Um, Because... You're able to just put whatever you have out, you know, and the people in message be like, yo, this is a cool mm-hmm. video. Sometimes I've gotten opportunities off of social media. I'm able to connect with people, mm-hmm. but social media can also be deterrent. That's what actually is a short film about where we're going to 
see social media from two people's perspectives um, and see sort of the dark side of that too. But I would say for me personally, social media has helped me because it had, I was able to see this podcast mm-hmm. through social media, you know, and it allowed me to have great relationships with people mm-hmm. and also see great work and put out great work. I like that. Um, so if you could redefine the term verified, what would you come up with? If I could redefine the term verified, I would say, you know, the approval of yourself. Mm. You know, I'm verified because I verify myself. I don't need you to verify who I am. Snaps, that's good. So I think that would that would be my personal point of view on verified, yeah. Before we go, shout out any projects that you have on. Um, what's your Instagram? Can we find you on a website? Yep. So um, MikeRegis.com, Mike Regis on Instagram, and 18th birthday private screen is coming out soon. Nice. Um, thank you, everyone, for tuning in and listening to Verified. Make sure that you check out our next episode next Friday. Thank you so much. 